if you've done this, uh, there will be, this one is not, this one is, is pretty well still uh, about as conclusive and encompassing as it can get for what its purpose is. Uh, this is more or less a uh, foundational lesson for the study. Uh, the other uh, lessons before we get to them, I'm going to go in and, and try to update some things so that it's not exactly the same uh, study that we've done in the past. Uh, but it's been, uh, when I looked at it, it's been about five years ago that we, uh, we did a Wednesday night study on spiritual warfare. Uh, but um, it just felt like it was relevant for the, the time that we're currently in. Uh, and uh, thought that it was, was fitting to uh, go back and look at this again and get a refresher for those that might remember going through it before. Uh, and get new information for those that maybe weren't there or were tied up teaching classes uh, at the time or uh, maybe even weren't members at the church yet when we did that. So uh, tonight we're going to start with uh, seven principles concerning spiritual warfare. If I can get my... There it goes, it woke up. Uh, while, while Paul was instructing Timothy... Uh, he talked about wage a good warfare. He talked about fight the good fight and endure leader, uh, hardships as a good soldier. Uh, and with that, we understand from much of what Paul wrote, not just to Timothy, but even in his other letters, Paul often referred to the Christian life as a battle. Uh, he talked about the struggle he himself had between knowing what he should do and not being able to do it and knowing what he's not supposed to do and finding himself doing it. Uh, and, and talked often about the battle that we, we have. And so uh, I, I want us to, to start tonight on this, this idea, this study of spiritual warfare, to understand what that means, what it looks like. Uh, this lesson is going to look at seven principles about spiritual warfare that we need to know, we need to understand in order for us to be victorious in this. Because the first thing I, I, I want to make sure we clarify from the beginning, a lot of times we talk about spiritual warfare, people get real scared. Uh, and they think, oh, I don't want to think about that. Well, the spiritual warfare is, is like a lot of things. Just because you don't think about it doesn't mean it's not happening. It doesn't mean it's not there. If you are a Christian, you are in spiritual warfare. The moment you wake up, uh, it, it starts. And for some of us, even at, at certain times throughout life, it happens even while we're sleeping. We, we wage war in, in that sense. Uh, but we cannot just stick our heads in the sand and hope that it blows over, hope that it, it, it fades, or think that if we, we live in oblivion to it, then it's not going to affect us. It's around us, so if we know that it's there, and if we know that we're going to face it, we need to be prepared. We need to know what we need to know. We need to know what the Bible says about it so that we can be prepared, so that we can be able to be victorious uh, in, in everything that we face. Uh, and so as we go through this, uh, this is not... By far, this is not everything that there is about spiritual warfare. If that were the case, it wouldn't be called a study. It'd be called a lesson. Uh, but we're going to have multiple lessons about this. Uh, but this really, uh, tonight, kind of sets that, that, that starting point, gives us the big picture, overall view of what spiritual warfare is, the critical things we need to understand, so that going forward as we look at the specific lessons, we see where each one of those fit in to this bigger picture. Uh, so the first thing we need to start off with is we have to know where the battlefield is. <clears throat> we have to know where our battlefield is. You know, if, if you're going to wage war, you have to know where you're going to fight. You have to know what the battle is. You have to know uh, where the war is going to take place. And the first battlefield that we face is probably the most critical, and that is the mind. <clears throat> our own mind is, is the greatest battlefield that we face. Uh, because we're constantly fighting, we're constantly wrestling with our own thoughts, with making sure, are we listening to the voice of God, or are we listening to our own wants, our own desires, our own plans, that kind of thing. Uh, Paul talks about this in Romans 7, when he said, For I delight in the law of God, according to the uh, inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Uh, so even Paul talked about this, this war that's going on in his mind that he knows God's law, he wants to do God's law, but there's another 
law that is there, and it's, it's the law of the flesh, it's the law of the desires of the heart, uh, and, and those things going at war within him. But we also know that there's a battlefield of the spirit realm. We wrestle in our mind, we wrestle in our heart, but we also wrestle within our spirit uh, to know that there is more than just us. And, and Paul talks about this oftentimes. One of the, the places is here in 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 3, where he says, For although we are walking in the flesh, we do not wage war in a fleshly way, since the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly but are powerful through uh, God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish any disobedience uh, once your obedience is complete. Uh, and, and so Paul reminds us, not only there, he did it again in Ephesians and a few other places where he wrote about spiritual warfare uh, in a sense, and he always talks about the fact that though we live in the flesh, our war is not in the flesh. Uh, our, our war is a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. <clears throat> it's something that we have to fight by feeding our spirit. One of the greatest things that we have, and, and we'll see this as we go throughout, but the, the greatest weapon that we have in our battle uh, in spiritual warfare is God's Word because His Word has the truth that we need to help us to understand everything that we need to do, everything that's expected of us, and it helps us keep in proper perspective who God is, what His will is, and the, the battle that not only we face, but the victory that we have in that battle, we know of because of God's Word. But Paul makes it obvious over and over that there's two main battlefields that we face. There's the battle of our mind, because part of our spiritual warfare that we go through is not only uh, a spiritual warfare as in God's Spirit within us versus the, the demonic forces that exist, but it's also God's spirit that is within us battling against our own flesh. That's part of our spiritual warfare as well. Both of these are, are critical to know and important for us to understand as we go forward. Which brings us to the next thing. We have to know who the enemy is. One of the most critical things, if you're planning on winning a war, you have to know who you're actually fighting. If you don't know who you're fighting, you're not going to know who to attack. You're not going to know who to defend against. Uh, and uh, so when it comes to spiritual warfare, we need to know our enemy. And of course, if we're going to do that, we have to start with our, the enemy that's been the enemy since the beginning, that is the devil, Satan himself, uh, and understand that, and, and I guess the best way for me to put this for us is he is not your enemy, he is not my enemy, he is God's enemy, and the reason he has become our enemy is because we are God's children. He doesn't fight with us. He attacks us to fight against God. He comes against us to try to stop us from doing what God desires for us to do, what God wants for us to do. He is the, the, the enemy uh, of God himself. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us what we can do uh, because of this enemy. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Putting on the armor of God, being prepared because we have an enemy, because he is out there. Peter warned us about him in 1 Peter 5, 8, where he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we know that he's out there. We're told time and time again, if we, if we take any time to read God's word, we understand that there's an enemy out there. He's a powerful enemy. He's a, uh, a, a vengeful and deceitful enemy. But there are certain things we need to understand. One is, even though he is powerful, even though he is wicked, even though he is deceitful, we as Christians do not need to fear him. We have no reason to fear him. Satan can only do to us as believers what God permits him to do. We see that very clearly play out in the, the story of Job uh, in the, the very beginning. We, we see where Satan comes and actually walks into the throne room of God, and God says, where have you come from? And he tells him, I've been walking and he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he brags on Job. God brags about him. And, and Satan says, well, of course he's going to be faithful to you. You've blessed him. You've allowed him to, to flourish. 
But if you'll let me come against him, he'll turn on you. And at first God says, well, I tell you what, I'll let you come against him, but you can't touch him. And Satan goes, and we know how the story plays out. Satan goes and he has uh, some of uh, Job's servants killed, some of his livestock stolen, and then ultimately all of his children are having a big dinner together and the house collapses on top of them, they all die. Well, still Job does not turn on God. Matter of fact, that's where we have that, that, that verse that is so uh, convicting and humbling that when Job receives the news of his children dying, it's the, the final straw of all the loss that he experienced in that day. And he goes, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That was his response. Satan again goes before God and says, yeah, but let me come against him. With each stage of what Satan wanted to do, he had to get permission from God because he doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the authority to come against us. He has to get permission. He has the ability in that he has the power to be able to cause problems, but he does not have the authority. He has to have permission, so we don't have to be afraid of him. And in Christ, we have been delivered from his power according to Colossians 1.13 and Acts 26.18. We've been delivered from it. God has set us free from his power, so he has no authority over us. God has promised that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our capacity. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation that's been given to you except what is common to man. And even in the temptation, God has provided a way out. God has made it possible for us to endure anything and everything that Satan throws at us. The times that we fail, the times that we fall, it's not because we can't turn away from the temptation, it's because we choose not to. And sometimes because we put ourselves in a situation where we're tempted to do things. But we don't have to fear him because God's given us the ability to overcome. In 1 John 5, 18, it tells us that Christ keeps us safe and Satan cannot lay hold of the believer to harm him. Romans 8, 37 through 39 tells us that even the demonic powers cannot separate us from God's love in Christ. We as believers do not need to fear him because those who are in Christ can overcome Satan. For those who are in Christ, we can overcome. We can defeat him. Not that we fight the battle, not that we go in and attack, but we stand in the victory that's already been given to us. We, we see references of this in Revelation 12, 11, Romans 10, uh, excuse me, Romans 16, 20. 1 John 2, 13 and 14, we, we find in 1 John 4, 4 that uh, the, the, the promise that John made that we've looked at recently, greater is the one who is in you than he who is in the world. The Spirit of God that is in us is greater than Satan who is in this world, greater than the enemy that comes against us. We don't have to be afraid because we can overcome through the power that God has given us. James 4, 7 tells us if we resist the devil, he has to flee from us. The reason he has to flee from us is because if we resist him, that means we're drawing near to God. Matter of fact, that's what the, 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 the whole passage says. If we submit ourselves to God, if we humble ourselves before God, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us because we're drawing near to God. We're being filled with God's power, being filled with God's spirit, protected by God's power. The enemy has to leave. We read just a minute ago there in 2 Corinthians 10 about the weapons that we have uh, that we've been given are able to pull down strongholds. They're, they're spiritual weapons. So if we have the weapons available, if we have the protection of God, we don't have to fear because we can overcome. And then Ephesians 6, almost the entire chapter, the majority of the chapter, is a, a reminder that we can put on the armor of God, that we can stand strong because of the armor of God. It's been given to us so that we can stand against the attacks of the enemy. All of those things are given to us there to help us to understand we can overcome. But he's not the only enemy that we face. It's not just the enemy of, of the devil, it's also the enemy of self. And I would dare say the majority of the struggle that the average Christian faces is with this enemy. It's the enemy of self. It's the enemy of routine. It's the enemy of that's the way we've always done it. It's the enemy of uh, it's just what I want to do. It's the enemy of emotion. All of that comes into play in this enemy of self. I want us to look at, at Romans chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 13, and it's kind of a lengthy passage, but I still want us to kind of go through it because it helps us to understand this. 
Paul's writing, he says, therefore, did what is good cause my death? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that law, the law is spiritual, but I am made of flesh, sold into sin's power. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discovered this principle. When I want to do good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh to the law of sin." long and somewhat confusing way Paul was saying I know what I'm supposed to do but sometimes I don't do it I know what I'm not supposed to do but sometimes I sort of find myself doing and then he identifies why because there is in me the desire to obey God's law but in my flesh in my natural man there is no ability to do it and he acknowledges this he acknowledges the war that he is at with himself Notice, he doesn't blame Satan. You say, oh yeah, but he blames sin. Yeah, but he blames his own sin, the sin of his flesh. He says, it's, it's sin that's doing it in me. It's my flesh that's causing these things to happen. And what Paul goes on later to say is that, but as Christians, we're no longer controlled by the flesh. We now have the spirit within us that can overcome the flesh. I've always looked at that passage and uh, enjoyed the fact the first time I found it and maybe not enjoyed the fact that might be too much, but was glad to see that even someone like Paul, th this great man of God that, that we read his, his writings, we, we read the letters that he wrote to the churches, and is just so full of, of great doctrine and teaching and, and such a great example. We read the, the, uh, the history of his life in the book of Acts, we think, man, what a great man of God, how devoted, how determined. And then you hear his own witness of himself, the struggle that he went through, and then it helps me to understand, you know what? I, I can still serve God even though I make mistakes because it's part of the battle we go through. Now, it doesn't excuse the mistakes, but it helps me to not feel completely hopeless, completely helpless, to know that God can still work in me even though there are mistakes that are made, even though there are sins that come up because he did it for Paul. And if he did it for Paul and Paul was able to accomplish what he did, then God work in me the same. God helped me to overcome my sinful flesh. God help me to set that aside. So what is it about the sin of, or the enemy of self that we need to understand? Well, first off, we need to understand that I am carnal, sold under sin. That's part of what, what Paul was talking about there in verse 14. Uh, and he says, in my flesh there's, there's nothing good. In Romans 8, 6, and 8, Paul goes on to say that being carnally minded is death. In other words, to, to be focused on the flesh, to be fleshly minded is death. We need to get away from that. Paul said, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I want to do. In my mind, I love God's law, but my flesh still overrides it sometimes. What he was saying is, we need to be focused on God's law. We need to be determined about God's law because the enemy of self is going to be strong sometimes. And it's going to be hard to overcome. We, we need to be willing. We need to be determined because if we give in and we allow our mind to be focused on the flesh, then we are living in the flesh. We're not just having moments where the flesh wins out and we sin, but we've accepted it. We, we've decided we're not going to fight, and we're just embracing it. And that's where he says to be carnally minded is death. To just give in to the flesh, to just let the flesh have its way, to just, well, God is just who I am. You just got to deal with it. That is a dangerous place to get. We need to understand the enemy so that we can overcome the enemy. 
David talked about it in Psalm 36, verses 1 through 4, where he describes the carnal man and he concludes, he does not abhor evil. In other words, that my flesh doesn't hate evil, but there is something in me that does. And, and I want it to overcome. I want it to, to win. Paul talked about there in verses 18 and 21 of Romans 7, we just read, I want to do good, but cannot. I want to do good. Yes, I, I'm carnally minded, I'm sown in, uh, or I, I am carnal, I'm sold under sin, but I want to do good, but I, I can't. In Romans 10, 3, it talks about the fact that we try to do things on our own instead of depending on God's righteousness, we fail. We cannot. And, and that's what Paul was saying when he said that I, I want to do, but in me there is nothing good. He wasn't saying I can never do anything good. He was saying in and of myself there's nothing good which is very similar to what Isaiah said when, uh, when, when he said that you know, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Our best efforts aren't going to be good enough. We can't be good enough, but the God that is in us can be. The Holy Spirit of God that works in us can do good for us and through us if we allow him to. In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. A lot of times people talk about, well, well Brother Jason, why, why is it that when I pray, we, we, we don't see it answered? Well, I think that verse answers a lot of it for us. Because a lot of times we pray for what we want rather than what God wants. We pray our will. If we prayed the same way that Jesus did, I believe we'd see our prayers answered a lot more often. Lord, not my will, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth even as it is, is in heaven. Those are the types of prayers that we need to be focused on. And if we are, that draws us into God's will where we can not only walk in God's will, but we also walk in His power and His authority. It helps us to overcome that carnal man within us, that flesh. But he also said in verse 22 that we have an inward man. And that inward man is fighting against the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us that the Holy Spirit lives within us. That's where Paul talks about, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And, and you know, that, that scripture uh, really speaks to me and, and uh, is one that years ago I, I had to really kind of uh, hold on to and kind of grip to because it, it, it seems sometimes that there are Christians there are church members that are so worried about the buildings that we gather in, but far less concerned about the temple. It's okay for me to do what I want to do when I'm away from church, but don't you dare do anything to desecrate the, the, the church, the house of God. You know, for example, and I, and I use this very loosely uh, because people do it and I don't think they mean what they're actually saying, I, I don't think the literal words that they're saying is exactly what they mean. Well, don't you dare lie. We're in the house of God. <laughs> okay, so then it's okay when you're not in the house of God? As a Christian, being the temple of God, carrying the Spirit of God, it's okay when we're away from a building made out of brick and mortar and steel and wood and all that kind of stuff. I, I think we've got it backwards. This that we're in is a building. Most of the time it's a gym. We think of it as just a building. Here for the last year it's been our worship center. It's, it has become the house of God for us, a place where we gather, the, the people of God gather to worship. But listen, this building is but a building. If it burns to the ground, the temple of God is still there. If the building next door that, that we consider our worship area, that we consider our sanctuary, if that burns to the ground, guess what? The temple of God is still there because we are the temple of God. We don't need a building. One of the most humbling things that, that happened to me in, in mission work ever was one of the first times that we went to Merida. And, and we get there, and they were so proud to show us a new property that they had bought that they were going to start meeting and having worship services at. And we go out to it, and it basically was a neglected pasture, a little bit bigger area than, than our gym floor here. Uh, over here, they had like a feeding trough, watering trough system with a little bit of a cover that barely covered the trough itself. 
and scattered throughout was shrubs about this high, a few trees, some boulders in the ground, uneven, uh, just real rough looking property. And they stood there as proud as could be of this. And uh, the first time I saw it, they were meeting at a house just down the road, having Bible studies and a, and a worship service each week. By the next time we went, they were having worship services out there, and we sent a team to it, and they came back and, and just looked at us and went, I'm, I'm blown away. And they showed us the picture because they told us, hey, we're, we're having worship at the new property. And in my head, having worship at the new property meant there was some kind of structure. Now all they had done was cleaned up some of the brush and over here under the shade of a scraggly under the slightly shade of a scraggly tree they had a cinder block a block of concrete a boulder and I think a bucket and had two 2 by 12s about 8 foot long sitting on top of those to make benches and that's where they sat to worship in the open I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico there are certain times when you're in Mexico that to be outside, you, you better have a gallon of water strapped to you because it is hot. It's miserable. If we ask Christians in America to show up and worship the way they were there, we would have churches that would have no members because we're so spoiled to air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter, a roof to keep the rain off of us. But the scripture tells us that we are the temple. You say, well, that's a, a long thing. I thought we were talking about spiritual warfare. We are. But here's the thing. When we realize that within us is the spirit of God and the power of God, then why do we have to be afraid? Why, why do we have to worry about losing the battle that we face, even against self, when we know that the power to overcome is within us? There is never a place that we as believers go that the, the power and presence of God does not go with us. We just have to allow him to do the work that he desires to do. And then number four, in this battle of self, Paul talks about the struggle between the carnal and spiritual natures there in verses 23 through 25. This is the, the war between the two is continuous. He talks about that even in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It's, it's an ongoing, never-ending. But in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, he tells us that if we walk in Christ, the war is won in Christ. We can overcome. We can be victorious. We can win by walking in Christ, letting Christ have his way in our life. That's how we overcome the enemy of self. The third principle of spiritual warfare is we need to know the enemy's strategy. It's not just knowing where the battle is. It's not knowing who the battle is against. We need to know what the enemy's strategy is. And from, from this point forward, we're, we're dealing maybe not primarily, but essentially with the enemy of the outward enemy. Uh, yes, we will touch a little bit more on the enemy of self, but most of this is on the enemy of, of the devil, of Satan himself. His strategy... It's to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he wants. That's, that's what Jesus told us in John 10, 10. He says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Our enemy, his desire, his strategy is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What he wants to do is disrupt your peace. He's going to do anything that he can to rob you of peace. He's going to have you uh, worried. He's going to have you doubtful. He's going to have you uh, angry. He's going to do anything that he can to disrupt your peace. He wants to destroy your, your soul and your witness. If he can keep someone distracted enough from being saved, he destroys their soul. If they get saved, then he wants to keep them distracted enough so that they don't have a witness. And he can destroy your witness in so many ways, and even more so today. I mean, we, we see it every day. Uh, all it takes is one person making an accusation. There doesn't have to be any proof. There doesn't have to be any evidence. If they make one accusation, if they get it publicized, that's it. You're done. It's over. And that's how our enemy works. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants to keep you from being able to be effective. He wants to derail your, your, uh, your spiritual growth, your Christian fellowship, your family. 
Anything that he can do to get you distracted, anything that he can do to get you off course, to get you out of focus of what God wants you to do. If he can derail you from thinking about serving God, then he knows he, listen, he knows that he's already lost you. If you are a believer, he knows he's already lost because you're saved. You're safe and secure in, in the, the blood of Jesus Christ in the hands of the Father. He can't touch you in that sense. But if he can keep you distracted, if he can keep you off focus, then he can keep you from being effective at helping others find what you found. He wants to divide your allegiance. You know, a lot of times we, we hear about, we see where churches have splits they divide, this group gets mad, they leave and they go do this, and everybody talks about, oh, well, that church split happened because of, and they've got some story. This person got mad at that person, these people got mad at those people, this group got mad at that group. I tell you right now, there may have been people involved, but that was an attack of the enemy. That's what he does. He divides us. Because if he can bring division, he's going to accomplish multiple things. Number one, he's going to do all of these that we just looked at. Because he's going to disrupt your peace because now you're mad. He, he's going to destroy your witness because now everybody in the community knows, well, I don't want to go to either one of those churches. The only reason there's two is because they can't get along. If they can't get along, then I don't want any part of that. He's going to derail your spiritual growth because now you're just focused on the fact that either you had to leave from that group or that the other group left. You're not growing spiritually in that moment at, at that time. It divides your allegiance because now there's a battle. Listen, I... I, I grew up around churches that, that had divisions. And you don't have to tell people that there's a division. You sense it. I remember as a teenager, any time that our youth group showed up at an activity or, or some big function where there was any type of competition and the youth group from the other church down the road showed up, oh, it was on. We didn't care if every other church in town showed up, but if that church showed up, oh, we can lose to everybody else, but we got to beat them. What did they do to us? Nothing. Both churches had been around far longer than any of us had, and probably more than, longer than any of our parents had. But there was still this idea of we're at war, even though we weren't really at war, but you know what I'm saying. We get to a point where we're, we're divided. But he also wants to bring death to you or your character. If he can destroy and kill your character, ruin your integrity, he's going to ruin your witness, therefore ruin your effectiveness in serving the Lord. He's going to do anything that he can because, again, he knows he can't get you, but if he can slow you down from serving God the way you want to in the way God wants you to, then at least he gets a small victory in it. That is his strategy. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring disrup disruption. He wants to bring destruction. He wants to, to divide us, derail us. He wants to keep us focused on anything and everything except serving the Lord. So how do we face his strategy? How do we deal with it? Well, we have to know where our strength is. If we know where our strength lies, then we know how we can fight. We know how we can overcome. We know how we can face his strategy. Number one, we already know what his strategy is, what he wants to accomplish. So how do we defend against it? Well, the first thing is with the word of God. Jesus set the perfect example for us back in Matthew chapter 4. That's where Jesus had for 40 days and 40 nights been in the wilderness fasting and praying. Hasn't eaten or drank anything in 40 days. He's done nothing but pray and, and draw close to the Father. And at the end of that time, Satan himself comes to Jesus. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's probably not a one of us in this room watching this video or anyone who's ever sat through any sermon or Bible study that I've done, and please don't take this the wrong way, but I don't think there's any of us that are important enough that Satan himself has come against us to tempt us, to fight us in any way. But he personally went to Jesus to tempt Jesus. We, we see it recorded in Matthew 4. Starting in verse 4, it says, But Jesus answered and said, as Satan is, is tempting him, Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
Satan tempts him again. Jesus says to him in verse 7, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan tempts him again. Verse 10, Jesus responds, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He said, well, you, you didn't even tell us what his temptations were. It doesn't matter. The point isn't what, Jesus, what Satan tempted him to do. The point is how Jesus responded. Because he could have, as Jesus, as the Son of God, he could have just said, would you shut up and go back where you belong? But he didn't, because he wanted to set an example for us. He wanted to show us how we can overcome. And what Jesus did for every temptation that Satan gave, he used God's word as his defense. He used God's word against what Satan was trying to do. Satan said, why don't you, man, you must be hungry after 40 days out here. Why don't you turn these rocks into bread? Scripture says man shouldn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What was he saying? Like, Satan, look, I don't need bread. I've been feasting with the Father. Oh, well, you know, his others were, well, go up here and, and throw yourself down off the cliff, and surely if God loves you enough, he'll come, he'll send his angels to rescue you. Scripture says, don't tempt the Lord your God takes him up on the pinnacle of, of the mountain and, 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 or the temple and shows him everything, everything that you see, I'll give to you if you bow down and worship me, which, just a side note here, probably the dumbest thing he could have done because Jesus already owned it all. He didn't say he was smart, just said he's deceitful. I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And finally he says, no, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. When we're tempted, when we come under attack, when we're going through spiritual warfare, there's a reason that Paul said we need to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's because this is our greatest weapon. And the one thing about it, when, when we talk about a sword, I think of, and I think I've said this almost every time we, we do this, but when I read that there in Ephesians 6 where Paul's talking about the, the weapons that we use, I don't think of some little fencing sword. I, I don't think of, you know, like a, a pirate sword. I picture Conan-type sword. Big old double-edged, long, broad sword, big, massive thing. And, and I say that not to, in, in the sense of, you know, we've got to be big, bad, and strong, but I think of God's Word in that way. That it's something we can use as a defense, we can defend against the attacks that come at us. With that sword, we can block those attacks, we can block those temptations, but at the same time, we can also advance and push the enemy away because God's Word gives us the victory. It gives us everything that we need, not only to defend ourselves, but also to pressure the enemy to leave. The greatest thing that we have in God's Word for that is the fact that it tells us we have the victory through Christ. Which brings us to the second thing. When we talk about knowing where our strength lies, it's not just in the Word of God, but it's also in the blood of Jesus. In the Word of our testimony and a surrendered life. God's Word gives us everything that we need to fight, but our confidence comes when we realize that we are His. That's where the blood of Christ comes in. Because were it not for the blood of Christ, you and I would not have the opportunity to have the power of God working in us or working for us. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Talking about those in the end that, that will face uh, against the, the great serpent, that will face against Satan. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to the death. In other words, it, it was the sacrifice of Christ, the blood applied to them that purchased their forgiveness, their freedom, their salvation is what started it. It's their testimony of saying, I know that I'm a child of God. I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I know that I have the victory and the fact that they surrendered their life completely. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. I'm safe and secure in God's hands. Even if in this life I die, it's okay. I'm safe and secure in God's hands. I think immediately of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he tells him, look, I'm going to give you one more chance. Bow down now, and, and we'll, we'll call everything even. But if you don't, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. I love their response. King, we will not bow down. 
We know that our God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. See, they had a confidence. We believe God will spare our life, but even if he doesn't spare us here, we're not going to turn on him because there's more to obedience to God than this life. That's the type of faith we need to have. We, we need to know where our strength is. Our strength is in Christ. Our strength is in the truth of his word. We also need to know what the, what the battle is all about. It's about heaven or hell. When it comes to spiritual warfare, that's, that's the core of it. We have an enemy that knows, not that he can see the future, not that he can read your mind, not that he can read the mind of God, but he can read just like you and I can. He's been around long enough that he probably saw when John was writing out what, what God showed him in the vision of Revelation. He knows that in the end he loses. He knows that in the end, he's going to suffer for all eternity. His goal between that, that realization and the moment it comes is to take as many people with him as he can. For him, the battle is, I'm going to do everything I can to take as many humans to hell with me as possible. Our battle is, God help us to do everything that we can to give every human the chance to be in heaven with you. John 3.18 Jesus said, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what's that got to do with spiritual warfare? That's what we're fighting for. That's, that's what our battle is for, to help people know that if they believe in Christ, they are not condemned, and they have a home forever in heaven. But if they refuse to believe, they're already condemned. And it's already done. So for us, we fight so that our testimony will be true. We fight so that we have a voice to tell them the truth of who Christ is. We fight so that they'll see evidence of him in us so that when we share that truth, when we tell them that this is what Jesus said, they not only see it in our life, but they believe it when we tell them. I'm not saying that if we do it right, we can convince every person. Listen, it's not up to us to convince. We're not supposed to convince people to be saved. We're just supposed to tell them they have the opportunity. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict and convince. And it's the individual's job to respond. But this is what the battle is about. It's about heaven or hell. It's about eternity. It's about the will of God, the work of God. And along the same lines of knowing where our strength lies, we also have to know what weapons we have. Going into Ephesians 6, we're not going to look at all of it uh, in detail, but I, I'm going to read that passage for us tonight to, to see uh, where our, our weapons are, what our weapons are. Paul says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We need to know the weapons that we have. We have the peace of God uh, that, that works with us, we have our faith in God. We have the righteousness of God. We have the, uh, the, the gospel uh, of Christ. We have truth. We, we have our salvation. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have all of these things that have been given to us so that we have the weapons we need to protect ourselves, to stand. I love the fact that, that when, when Paul wrote this, and, and again, I say Paul wrote this, I, I love the fact that God made sure that Paul wrote this. From chapter 6, verse 10, through the end of the chapter, over and over and over again, Paul makes the emphasis of to stand, that you'd be able to stand. When all is done, to stand. Why? Because he knew that the enemy was going to constantly try to knock us down, constantly try to trip us, constantly try to trick us, constantly try to beat us down. But we can stand because God's given us everything that we need. 
We can stand because he's given us the truth to stand on. We can stand because he's filled us with his peace to stand on. We can stand because he's filled us and surrounded us with his righteousness to stand on. We can stand because he's given us faith that we can stand on. We can stand because he's given us salvation that we can stand on. We can stand because he's given us his word that we can stand on. We can stand in this battle, in this war, because he's given us every weapon that we need. You know, wouldn't it be horrible if our military, when, when young men and young women signed up to enlist for the military, they went off to training, they trained them in everything, taught them how to use every weapon that was out there, taught them how to drive every vehicle, and then a war came, and they bring them, and they load them all up on this plane, like, hey, look, hey, we're going to drop you into enemy territory, and you're going to go fight the war, but we're going to leave all the guns and all the tanks and all the grenades and the tear gas and your knives and all of that. We're, we're going to leave all that back at base camp because you only need that when you're there. Th those things are important when, when we're all together safe where we're supposed to be. But now that you're going out into war, you're going out into that area, let's just, just go. You, you got this. I don't know any soldier that would ever sign up for that army again. I don't know any soldier that would survive. And yet, how often do we as Christians fight our spiritual warfare that very way? Oh, the Bible's important when we go to church on Sunday. You can't go to church without your Bible. But where is it the rest of the week? Is it, is it used? Is, is it a weapon for us, or is it just part of our Sunday attire? What about our faith? Oh, our faith is important on Sunday. We love to sing about our faith. Oh, but this, you, you know I'm a Christian. You, you know you see me every Sunday. And it, it, it's not, if, if the closest thing we have to using the weapons that God has given us is how we look and act on Sunday, we're, we're, we're missing the whole point. We're, we're going unprotected into battle every day. And then coming back wondering why we're losing, why we're struggling. These weapons have been given to us for a purpose and for a reason. And then finally, number seven, we have to know where the victory lies. We talked about this a little bit, that scripture there in, in Revelation, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives even unto death. But there's, there's more detail to that. Our, our victory comes first by faith of the born-again believer. That, that's our victory. Our victory is the faith that we have in Christ because it connects us to the power of God. It gives us access to God's Word. See, before you're saved, this, this is a book of words. You may think of it as God's Word. It, it may be God's Word, but it's not a weapon for you. It, it's a book containing truth, containing great things, powerful things, but it has no purpose for the person who is lost other than drawing them to salvation. But after salvation, after we place our faith in Christ, this becomes our life source. It's not just a weapon we take into battle. It is daily instructions for how we live the life God wants us to live. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith in Christ. Our faith in who he is, in what he has done. Our faith that he works in us and for us. Verse 5 of that same chapter says, Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Not just faith. And I know we talked about that when we went through 1 John. It's not just having faith. It's having faith in Christ. Faith in the one who makes the difference. Our victory also lies in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God that is in us gives us access to the victory, gives us the ability to have the victory. Again, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 this time. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
the Holy Spirit in us is greater than the one in the world, greater than the enemy that we face, greater than those who serve him, greater than those who, who tempt us, greater than those who come against us, greater than those that we see on a regular basis that sometimes we think they're the enemy, but they're really not. It doesn't matter who. The Spirit of God in us is greater. Of course, our victory lies in God himself. We talked briefly about this verse earlier, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is the source of our victory because God has already set our steps in place. He's already made it possible for us to be successful. If we follow him, if we walk where he wants us to walk, if we do what he wants us to do, if we say what he wants us to say, we will be victorious over the enemy every single time. We fail when we take our eyes off of him. We fail when we do our own thing rather than his thing. We fail when we think we know better than God does. And finally, our victory is in Jesus. And hopefully you see how all four of these work together. In 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, who always gives us victory in Christ. So how do these four work together? Our faith in Christ is connected to the will of God, which then places within us the Spirit of God, which connects us to the power of God. Therefore, all encompassed, we have the victory. Because it's God working in us. Through the sacrifice of Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, connected to us by our faith, we have the victory. I always find it important, if, if we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, that we need to understand that before we look at anything else. We need to know the battle that we're in. We, we need to know that it's, it's difficult. We need to know that there's uh, so much that, that goes on. We need to know that, uh, that we have an enemy we have to be aware of. We have to be alert of what he's doing. But we also need to know that everything we need to be victorious has already been given to us, provided for us. The victory is there. It's up to us whether or not we claim it through the life that we live. Now, I'm not talking about a, a, a name it and claim it. I'm just, God, give me the victory today. It takes more than that. It, it takes deliberate obedience. It takes deliberate sacrifice. It takes deliberate study. We must make the effort. But the victory is there. It's already been purchased the blood of Christ. It's already been provided by the power of God. We just have to walk in it. We have to live according to his will. Walk where he wants, say what he wants, do what he wants, and then we live in the victory that he's already provided for us. As we look at this, this study on spiritual warfare, I, I hope that we don't get so caught up in identifying an enemy, in, in thinking about how intimidating the thought of spiritual warfare is that we forget we already won. We've already won. We're on the winning side. You know, I know the, the, the worst thing you could do to somebody who likes to read, loves to read, is, is to tell them you read the end of the book before you read the beginning. Now, I know people that they do that. They go find a book, they've heard it's good, they read the end to see if, they're, if it's worth reading, and then they go in and they read the rest of it. I can't do that. I, I'm not a big reader. I don't read a lot. But I don't want to read the end and then go back. If I read the end, then there's no point in reading the book for me or, or, or watching a movie. If I get stuck seeing how it ends, I'm probably not going to be interested in watching how it goes through because now there's, there's nothing about it that, that entices me. But when it comes to living this life, when it comes to understanding what God has done and what he's going to do, 
we can go in and we can read everything that he's already said is going to happen in the end. We can read that we're already victorious. And that doesn't make it boring for us. It makes it that much more exciting because we know it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do, we can be victorious because God's already declared that we're victorious. It doesn't matter what lie the enemy tells us, we know the truth because God's already declared the truth. We have it. We know it. So as we go into this, don't think of it as, oh, we're going to learn all this, this, this scary stuff. No, all we're going to do throughout this whole thing is we're going to learn how to be victorious, how, how to live in the victory that God's already provided for us by identifying more specifically who our enemy is, how we can overcome him, how we can take back from him things that he's stolen from us in our past, how we can stand and live in victory, how we can help others have victory. We're going to look at all of that throughout this study. And I hope and I pray my, my goal is, is not to scare people into believing in spiritual warfare. My, my goal is to equip people to be confident in spiritual warfare, to equip them to be victorious so we don't have to live in fear because fear is not something God wants for us. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in fear. You can live in faith and you can live with the victory because God's already provided it for us. So let's close in prayer for tonight and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I want to come before you and I want to thank you, God, for the opportunity to be able to be here tonight. And I, God, I thank you that your word tells us that there is a battle, there is a war, there is an enemy. But God, I thank you that your word also tells us we've already won because you won. You provided the victory for us through your son, Jesus Christ. So God, as we go through this, this study, these weeks of talking about spiritual warfare, God, I pray that each week you would build even more confidence within each and every one of us. God, that you would help us to be not only assured of our salvation, but God, we would be confident in our faith, confident in you. God, that we would know how to fight effectively. God, that we would know how to stand on the truth. God, we would know how to defend ourselves against the attacks of the enemy. So that when all is said and done, we can still stand strong for you. May God be with us as we leave from this place tonight. I pray that you watch over us the rest of this week. Help us, Lord, to, to make it all home safe with all the rain that's happened today. And Lord, I, I do want to take just a moment to again lift up to you all those, uh, Lord, that have been caught up in the, the situation there in the Gulf off of Grand Isle, Lord, the boat that capsized, the, the, the missing workers and the search that continues. Father, I, I just pray that you would do a special work there. Lord, and any who still stand in threat from that storm, I, I pray that you would give protection. Lord, we put it in your hands. We trust it to you and ask that you would be merciful. I ask that you would do a miracle. We love you, Father. We give you praise for who you are and all that you do. We ask it all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.